Hi, folks, and welcome back to the rest of our program. Surprise! I am joining you through the magic of our partner Zoom as we speak with three incredible panelists today to discuss a great topic, which is the future of work and learning. And I'm particularly excited because all three of our panelists were doing those things long before COVID-19 made it sort of a mainstream feature of what's happening so they can tell us the lessons that they've learned and as well as considerations for the future. I'd like to have each of our panelists take a moment to introduce themselves and their organizations. Erica, can I start with you, please? Great, thanks, Ashley. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica McManus. I am the co-founder and chief people and community officer at Instant Teams. Instant Teams is a remote team marketplace. We are building um, customer support, sales support, tech support teams for small to medium level enterprise companies and using untapped talent communities, specifically the military spouse and veteran communities um, to build out those teams. I'm also an active duty military spouse um, going on 20 years. Great, thank you. Plinio, can I have you introduce yourself next? Yep, one moment, we're having an issue with your audio. Let's see if we can get you on. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Well, Ashley, it's a pleasure to see you again. And it's a, a real pleasure to be on this panel with Jeremy and Erica. Um, my name is Plinio Ayala. I'm president and CEO of a national IT workforce development nonprofit called Perscolas. We are an organization now located in 19 cities serving what will be upwards of 4,000 Americans this year, uh, preparing them for IT careers uh, through very rigorous training. Um, and then working with employers to place them in, in these good paying IT jobs. Great, and Jeremy. Thank you very much for having me. I am Jeremy Petrenka. I am an Associate Dean and Associate Professor of the Practice and Economics at Duke University and the Fuqua School of Business. Wonderful, well, thank you all again for joining us today. Erica, if you don't mind, I'm gonna kick things off with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Instant Team started and how your personal story helped shape the mission of the company? Yes, um, I would love to. I think it's such a neat story in connection to, you know, your topics today with whether it's learning or telehealth or remote work. Um, we've done a little bit of all of that. Um, where we really started was six years ago um, in 2016. I joined forces with another active duty military spouse. Her name is Liza Rodewald. And she was in the software engineering space at the time. I was out in Silicon Valley building um, user acquisition and community growth um, teams and pods and strategy for startups out there. And when we crossed paths, we realized that there was an opportunity sitting between what she had seen in kind of the software engineering space, needing immediate quick access to remote teams, obviously even before the world kind of came to that realization through the pandemic. And I had seen that I had the opportunity to build teams with people I knew from all over the world. We've moved 12 times in 20 years. So I have a great network of peers and colleagues and fellow military spouses that I had come in contact with you know, across the nation and, and even overseas. And the solution at hand was building a marketplace that brought all of that talent that no matter where they sat out in the world to these companies that at that time had no um, maybe even awareness that that untapped type of talent was sitting out there. And second, no way to actually connect with them. So we have been able to build um, our entire organization from day one, 100% remote, fully digital, fully tech driven and enabled. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into it later, but we've even done three rounds of fundraising as female founders, 100% remotely through the internet, um, despite being told, you know, that that just wasn't how things worked and that's how it wasn't going to be a, a next success. But I think we've been able to prove over and over again that access to the internet brings additional opportunities and you just have to continue to be creative and ways to utilize that. That's great. And that's a great segue to Plinio talking a little bit about Perscolas and equity is a very essential part of the mission of the organization. And Erica touched a little bit about using the internet and these kind of programs to 
bring people who may have been left behind by traditional workforce models or changing skill requirements. How do you embrace that? And why is equity such an important part of your mission? From the very beginning, Ashley, we were um, founded on the concept of equity. You know, we realized back then that there was tremendous power in technology to move black and brown communities ahead. We started this refurbishing operation where we would go out and solicit end of life computer equipment from corporations, bring them back to this warehouse in the South Bronx. And we would refurbish the computers and get them back out into the hands of people in our community. That if you recall at the time, the cost of a new computer was in the thousands of dollars, untenable for many of our residents. And so we were able to get thousands of computers out, not just in the South Bronx, but in communities across New York City. And over time, 100,000 computers were distributed. And we were able to do that by building a local workforce and uh, realize that we couldn't keep our staff very long. Within six months of their tenure, they were leaving us. And as we started to lean into the why, we realized that that problem was really an opportunity. People were leaving us because they now had a skill that translated to a lot more money than we could pay. And so over time, as the internet became more ubiquitous and the cost of computers came down and we thought quite incorrectly that the digital divide was fixing itself, we pivoted away from the digital divide and refurbishing work and focused focus exclusively on IT workforce development. And now this organization, as I mentioned earlier, has evolved into 19 cities. We run multiple training tracks working with employers to help build these amazing careers for individuals who are incredibly talented, tremendously gritty. All they're looking is for that one opportunity that can transform everything for them. Our graduation rate is over 85%. Our placement rate is 80%. And at the end of the day, training individuals who are underrepresented in tech is a powerful way of improving equity in all of our communities through these high paid jobs that really move the needle around economic mobility. Great. Jeremy, turning it to you, one of the things we talked about in our prep session was when I entered college back in the stone age of the year 2000, it was a miracle that we could email professors. Now, how much has changed? How has the School of Business sort of embraced both online and hybrid models? And tell me a bit about that sea change. Oh, you are still a youngster <laughs> if you were in undergrad <laughs> in 2000. So for me, it was actually, I remember in, what are we, we're gonna say 94, um, I actually was able to call a professor and thought that that was a very large deal. Um, email made it easier to connect with faculty at any time, but it still had this asynchronous piece. It's still very difficult. You know, either if a student is having difficulties, um, whether it's a mental health issue, whether it's just a general, you know, something that, that's acute at that moment, or in terms of actually helping them understand a more complex concept. That's hard to do over, over email. You, you pretty much need that in person. It needs to be a conversation. Um, it, it can't be this, this asynchronous back and forth. And so what we found, especially um, COVID sort of forced our hand on this, that, that before that faculty were a bit more um, hesitant to have student meetings over Zoom. It was kind of felt in person. Well, obviously that puts a lot of restrictions on when and where uh, that, that can happen. And once COVID hit and Zoom just became the norm coming out of it now, Zoom is still the norm and it makes it so much, I actually feel more connected with my students through the virtual medium because I don't feel like I have to ask them to meet me on my schedule. That if, if they need me at you know nine at night, I can very easily hop on a Zoom call very quickly at nine at night and have a conversation that, that they need to have at that moment in a way that I just wasn't able to before. And it really has kind of transformed what that experience is in, in both directions. Great, Jeremy, I think we'll continue with you a little bit to elaborate on that story. What, who is the typical School of Business student? And has remote learning changed the type of students that are enrolling in your programs? So what you see across business schools is there are generally three types of students. You have the traditional uh, you know, full-time MBA students, 
which is going to be late late twenties, early thirties. Um, those normally still stay at the in person model, and we haven't seen as much transformation there. You then see kind of a new innovation in the space over the last ten years: the one year programs, the things like masters in management where people right out of undergrad, maybe one year of work um, that are kind of looking to, to jump ahead, that we're seeing more hybrid models. But where we've seen so much uh, transformation is in our working professional students. Um, Fuqua was actually, we were, we've kind of been a first mover in this space for a long time that we first started having some virtual elements in the early 2000s with some of our global MBA programs where the students are able to have a week in person in a location around the world, but then every weekend they would have the virtual sessions. And, and by necessity, what we did in person versus virtual, you know, most of it was front loaded in the in person. There's only so much we could do virtual. As the 2010s rolled on, we realized that technologically we were able to rethink how those programs were delivered. And you know, especially with, with mid to late 30s and in the 40s, people don't wanna quit their jobs. Um, we need to meet them where they are and where they are is continuing to work, but letting them have an experience and an educational experience that matches them where virtual allows us to do that. And so we have now significantly expanded on what our offerings look like, on what the right blend is in terms of in-person versus virtual. And it has significantly opened up, um, really opened up our options on, on who, we can, who we can reach, who we can help, um, and then just where, where students are that potentially we can help propel them in their careers. Plenio, meeting people where they are, I know is a key part of what you've done. You mentioned earlier that Perscolas is based in the Bronx. And one of the things we talked about before is that transportation is often one of the barriers for people to get access. Uh, it sounds cliche, but it's hard to go anywhere in New York City in an efficient amount of time. So even for your local folks, let alone the 19 other cities that you serve, how have you made that change to make the online portions just as enriching as any in-person programs that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I will answer this in a number of ways because I think it's important to introduce a couple of these points. You know, like Jeremy, and, and, and the school he, he, he teaches at, um, we began to experiment with virtual training prior to the pandemic. And thankfully we did, we invested in technology, we trained staff and when the world stopped spinning in 2020, we were able to make that conversion. Um, and I held my breath for a month and a half because I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, quite a feat, I don't recommend anybody do that. But you know, at the end of the day, every month that passed by, we were able to improve our outcomes. However, what we noticed right away was that many of our students didn't have the right computers um, or any computer or broadband, frankly, to be able to take the course. And so we had to move money around in our budget to be able to open up an equipment distribution center in the Bronx where we were sending computers and other pieces of equipment across the country. Um, and that was the right thing to do because it was able to get our students to the finish line. We continue to do that in some cases, having distributed thousands of pieces of equipment uh, since the pandemic hit. But we've learned a number of lessons, right? We saw that remote training eliminated a lot of those transportation issues that you mentioned. People that lived in Staten Island that were just not going to travel to the Bronx. Now we're taking classes remotely. Uh, we had an increase in the number of women that were participating in our training program because they had built-in childcare, right? They were taking the course at home and able to take care of their children uh, from home. All of those lessons learned have allowed us to rethink how we want to move scale forward for the organization. But I'd love to get your input on this, Jeremy. I am concerned that we are moving so far to just remote training. I think in many ways, remote training by itself creates an inequity that we need to be aware of, right? It's very exclusionary. Not everybody can participate in a remote training experience. And there are a good number of folks in our communities that prefer the in-person training or variation thereof. And so 
as we move down this road of virtual training and we are adopting it in so many ways in our lives, I, ca I would caution us not to um, dismiss the importance of in-person training because there are many, many folks out there that prefer that as a way of work. Thank you. Erica, the military community, spouses, and enrolled and enlisted members were sort of early adopters of this type of remote communication just because of the nature of how the military is global. There's a lot of movement. Can you tell me a bit about what the experience was like before the pandemic and then the change that you saw at Instant Teams once it hit? Yeah, I always like to say that military spouses were the original digital nomads before it became, you know, kind of TikTok and Instagram worthy to, to show that you were, were, were working around the globe. Um, and that was really out of necessity, right? Moving every two to three years, taking a career with you is, is really, really difficult. Um, and out of that necessity and commitment to the community that Liza and I saw around us, like we saw that, you know, opportunity for invention and then bringing those together. Um, we were about three years into kind of building that foundation and proving out that concept before the pandemic hit. And so I would say the biggest changes, especially as a marketplace, two-sided. Um, Pre-COVID, our customer conversations were a lot more educational around remote work, meaning this is how a remote team can function for you. This is the, you know, breaks down geographic barriers and brings in this amazing diverse talent community when you just really have open doors 100% and really having to convince um, individuals kind of into that model. Versus post-pandemic, we had people coming to us even for follow-up conversations, right? Like, hey, remember when you told me about that re that remote team about eighteen months ago? Now we understand, and you know, now we see the opportunity at hand. And again, it became a necessity. So that's been a really place to be in the marketplace, you know, leading and growing remote teams anywhere from the actual operational function of that in a remote workspace through the internet, but also the culture and the belonging. And I think I've heard both uh, Jeremy and Planio kind of mentioned that is, is that connection and that cultural piece. Um, and then on the talent or the military spouse side, just the increase of options. So again, originally it was a necessity. Now it's an option. And now that option is not, you know, something that people come just to instant teams for that option to work remotely has grown exponentially across, you know, various industries. I'd say the biggest thing that we've seen a gap in is needing to train and bring people into just what being in a remote environment means from a communication standpoint, from even setting up your home environment, right? Some of that doesn't come naturally to individuals who've just never done it. They're used to leaving their home life behind them and moving into a professional setting. And, and suddenly when that combines, um, there is some education and some awareness and some training. And so we did end up um, creating something that we call the Remote Ready Boot Camp that anybody coming into our um, marketplace takes. So they just have like that um, same experience, kind of set the expectations up front. And we have found that when you prepare and provide people that opportunity up front, it really just sets everybody up for success longer. And Erica, can you share with our audience a little more about the story of how Instant Teams worked with the state of Hawaii during the pandemic? Yeah. So. That was a really interesting time, again, having kind of been three years into um, the model of remote work. So when the pandemic hit, um, we actually ended up working with the state of Hawaii on um, hospitality and tourism shut down overnight, right? Hundreds and thousands of individuals in unemployment, employment crisis, financial crisis. And so the state quickly brought together, you know, players within um, their state uh, leadership and said, hey, what are some pilots? Like, we've got to move fast. We've got to be able to do something. Um, we had built um, a Hawaii network out there. We had done some of our angel fundraising out there. And so we were kind of on the on the scene as been, um, you know, successful proven models in remote work. And so what we did is we proposed and we were able to, for a period of a year, put through individuals in both a sales support course and a customer support course fully digital, fully remote training, and then put them into their first job, um, depending on which course they were in. And so it was really proving the model of that reskilling, skilling opportunity, taking somebody out of, you know, great skill sets and really bringing that skill-based approach to their employment versus, you know, a background that maybe is um, resumes looked at chronologically, right? That's important, but a chronological background of somebody really doesn't 
depict their skill set and readiness in a remote workspace. So um, it's a fascinating model that we also were able to um, reinvent um, with the Department of Defense over the past year, reskilling people into new skill tracks, software engineering, data analysts, um, sales support. And so I think the opportunity for people to continue to think about that, like if you're seeing a gap in your, um, whether it's a marketplace or an industry or as an employer, bringing in those reskilling, you've got a great panel of, you know, education, learning and development minded individuals here who have seen it work. And so it's just exciting to see people continue to pick that up. Thank you. Cindy, I'd like for you to expand on that. Tell me a bit about the typical path that a per scholar student takes from the day that they join your program, the support and resources you give them to up until the types of skills that they're developing and the jobs they go to. We run multiple training tracks. Uh, I think part of the secret sauce of this organization's success has been our ability to work with employers to construct these training models so that we are training our graduates for skills that are relevant now. And we then go back to those employers and hold them accountable to hiring our graduates. Um, folks start um, in entry level jobs, uh, anywhere from uh, help desk support to junior Java developers to early cybersecurity um, analysts. Um, but I think part of our strategy, what we realized during the pandemic was that we were celebrating the wrong um, uh, KPI, right? We were celebrating that first job. It was in many ways four times more than what they were making prior to training, but it was not enough. We need to get folks to the point where they're building wealth. And so we made an intentional decision to stay with our graduates for two years post-graduation and provide additional upskilling opportunities to our students so that we're moving them into that second and third job where we see pretty significant increases in salaries. The internet is an incredible tool for us to be able to do that because all of that work is done remotely. And we need to make sure that our students have, as I mentioned earlier, the equipment and the broadband to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. But for us, the biggest change in our KPI is measuring where people are two years later. And the hope is that they're making 30, 40% more than what they were making uh, two years prior. Oh, that's such a great point about that continual development and how the internet can make that a little easier. Jeremy, I'm sure that's something you see in a graduate school program, of course, of people kind of come in in the beginning with one set of skills, one path that they want to go to, and then maybe it changes by the end. How do you stay on top of students? Is that something the internet helps with to really make sure that they're moving along your tracks as well as possible? Yeah, so we have kind of piggybacking off what Plinio said is it while they're here we have a pretty good eye on them <laughs> while they're while they're physically here now obviously for our fully online program that's a very different uh that's a very different scenario we can't literally look over their shoulder and so that's one where um the way that we have designed our fully online programs where there's synchronous there's asynchronous all of it is linked to a you know to one learning management system that lets us see are they in fact doing everything that we know they need to do to progress the way they need to and then obviously there, there's assessments but then hitting to the same idea of well, what about once they're out of once they're out of our program um one of the things that fuqua has is with our career management center you have access to them for life and so that same idea of well where are they progressing we are seeing the exact same thing especially in our quantitative management programs the first job is is great. You know, we we want our students to have amazing first jobs. It's the second job that you start seeing the big jump, and then the third job in a lot of cases. And they are happening at that two to three year mark. And what we're seeing is our students. Anytime you're talking about the more quantitative, uh, especially the more either data related or or computer science or technician related or cyber related areas, what you learn is relevant for about six months to a year after that. And then there's something that has evolved. You know, it's not gonna be a complete shift, but you need to be upskilling pretty much consistently. And the amount of online resources where upskilling becomes possible, in a lot of cases free, if not free cheaply, is 
astounding that I, I remember when Khan Academy first started becoming a thing, which was, you know, just some, just some guy, well, Khan, <laughs> um, making videos for, I believe his niece and nephew. And suddenly it started transforming what is actually possible. And we're seeing it. I mean, even students in the program, they feel like they have a weakness in something. We will sometimes offer co-curricular, but in a lot of cases, they will just find it. As part of uh, as part of them being students here, for instance, Duke has a partnership with Coursera. And so there's so many ways that we can say, look, we can't offer 2,000 classes, but if you're interested in this, they can. And so it's this amazing way to upskill or even explore new areas that just did not exist 20 years ago. And Plinio, what have you seen in terms of the skills that are in demand, say, prior to the pandemic or even now? I know you focus quite a bit on IT, which the definition of those skills and what has come about has changed so much. Um, we're seeing, especially right now, a shortage of cybersecurity professionals. And that is more important than ever as we bring more things online. Tell me a little bit about how you've been able to keep up with the latest and make sure you're sending your graduates out as well prepared as possible. I think you're right. I think cybersecurity specialists, um, there's still a dearth of programming talent. Um, cloud computing has become a, a huge need for, for employers. And the truth is that there will be 10 different new jobs that will be created in the next five years that we don't even know about right now. I think what allows us to remain relevant with our training is our ability to engage employers. They are uh, sort of at the center of our program design. They inform every aspect of our program, curriculum, assessments that we create. They're part of the screening process for our students. And at the end of the day, they're hiring our graduates in large numbers. It is through our employer partners that we are, are able to stay uh, pretty much up to date with what's trending in the space and be able to iterate our curriculum consistently so that we are making changes in real time um, so that we're producing the talent that, that is needed right now. I think that that approach is, um, is perhaps the most effective way of doing workforce development without um, having employers at the table, you're really train, training and praying, right? Which is an approach that hasn't been very effective historically. You've got to have them be part, um, uh, uh, be part, be a partner in the process. And that's been one of our most effective strategies going forward. Erica, I'd like to bring it back to what you mentioned in the beginning about how Instant Teams has been able to grow as an employer, as an organization, all thanks to the internet in some really unexpected ways. So can you share your story of some of the fundraising adventures that you were on virtually? Yeah, I'm happy to. And actually, I just wanted to let you know this morning, we kind of shared that, you know, this network was, or this panel was happening with Network On um, today with our employee base. And we kind of challenged everybody, like, why is this possible with the internet? Like a really simple question. And um, I'll have to send you an email wrap up of the responses we've gotten. It's just it's incredible that something like we take for granted, right? Just access really does change lives and brings opportunity. Not only opportunity that's already been charted, but creative ways where you there really is an opportunity to chart a path. If you don't see a specific path for you that's already molded and built, the internet brings the opportunity for individuals, whether it's business, whether it's personal advancement, whether it's wealth creation, to chart and find those paths. You can Google and teach yourself anything, literally anything. Um, and Liza and I, you know, on the fundraising trail, we're, we're female founders. There's six children between the two of us. We are army spouses. So our active duty service members are still traveling, gone months on end. And we knew going into, you know, the startup space um, as a tech startup, at some point, you know, with the projection of our growth, we were going to need to go on the investment trail. And traditionally, uh, that's done in a very mobile way, right? You pack up, you hit hit all the big, you know, hotspots, San Francisco, you know, New York, Atlanta, and you're gone for months on end living out of a suitcase. Um, and that works. And that's worked for many. But we knew that that could not be our journey. Like if we were going to be successful, it was going to have to be done in a different way. Um and we were able to fundraise all three rounds and all three rounds were a different experience, um, but 100% remote. Um, our angel round was done with the Hawaii Angels. 
and Liza was living there at the time. They were stationed there. So she was on site, but I was piped in on a computer screen in the middle of a room and I just got turned to whoever, whichever investor was asking me the question. Um, and it worked, right? It was, it was the first time that they had really had that kind of experience. Um, but the neat thing about building remote teams in a remote way is that we really live true to our brand each and every day. Um, Liza and I've never lived in the same place. We've always been remote founders. We've never had a headquarters. Um, so again, I think we take that for granted that we've been able to do that, but it really does prove that where there's a will, there's a way. The internet brings access to creation and opportunity. Um, and even in our last round, um, it was right after the pandemic and this a specific investment firm had never done anything virtual. They'd always had people come on site, but you know, it would think it was like April, 2020. They're like, well, we can't shut down operations. So what are we going to do? And they brought everybody online. It was the first time they had done it. And Liza and I were actually helping operate uh, the, the Zoom call from the background. So we were there to pitch for investment, but we ended up helping um, just because we had been doing it for three years. So it's just been a really fascinating experience to have that opportunity and have that access um, specifically in the female founder space, there's already, you know, limited venture capital going into those organizations. And so be able to prove out models, kind of challenge the status quo, um, shatter some ceilings, you know, the internet is really what has allowed us to do all of that. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Plinio, we're talking about, you know, access and growth. We've discussed how access to broadband is a really important part of connecting people to resources they need. We know there's a lot of movement at the local, state, and federal government level to give people increased access, but what are some of the other ways that governments, policymakers at all levels can give more support to programs like yours, and especially those that are trying to achieve more equity in the workforce? You know, we are trying to increase the representation of women and people of color in tech. And we're trying to do that in large numbers. And just to give you uh, some, some context, back in 2019, we trained about 1,000 individuals that year. We'll train close to 4,000 individuals this year, but that's not enough. To truly create equity, we need to be serving tens of thousands of people a year. And that's our goal. We are looking to be at a rate of serving 10,000 Americans a year in the next four years, but historically, our financial model has been built on philanthropy. And that, in many ways, does not scale us to 10, 20,000 Americans a year. We are one of very few organizations in this country that's gone through two random control trials. Uh, the most recent one indicated that the return on an investment in Perscolas is 800%. In other words, for every dollar invested, there's an $8 return. And it seems kind of intuitive to me to think that our budget, um, only 6% of our revenue is government. And that says a lot, right? I think that there's an opportunity for government, both at federal, state level, and even at the local level to invest in proven models, organizations that are showing results in ways that allow us to scale uh, much more significantly than the way we're thinking now. I don't think that we could do that solely uh, through philanthropy. Um, government needs to get involved. Often we don't pursue government dollars because they're very restrictive. Um, they don't allow us to really implement the model the way we've designed it, the way it's proven. Um, and we continue to want to work with government. And so we are incredibly open to continuing dialogue with officials who, throughout various parts of, of our government structure. Uh, to figure out this conundrum, because I think um, unlocking that can help Perscolas and many other organizations who are proven to scale and have greater impact across our country. Well, I think what we're doing today just kind of underscores, uh, as Erica said, as you said, we can find time to have these conversations with people in other ways, not just physically in person. Uh, Jeremy, as an instructor, what has the move to online learning and hybrid models done for you? And what do you hear from your students? So there's a short term answer and a longer term answer. The short term answer is, and Plenty, I'm sure you saw this as well, in March of 2020, even if you were ready for it, 
it was not a smooth welcome change. It was a forced change, um, you know, especially on an in-person, you know, an in-person program, especially, you know, at, at Duke and Fuqua where, you know, the tuition's fairly healthy, suddenly saying, and tomorrow and for the rest of the term, it's going to be online. Um, there were some, uh, there were some transition pains with that. I think across the board, what we heard from our students, which was really quite remarkable, their learning didn't get fundamentally affected. Now, there's so much more that is developed in some of the in-person ones, and I think finding that blend is really where where it exists is, you know, some of the social elements, some of the networking elements, some of the, the what I call the negative space between classes, you know, what you're talking to your classmates about when you're in the hallways. But in terms of the sheer learning, we were able to switch that in a way that, uh, you know, I mentioned to this to you before, 20 years ago, if COVID had hit the way it hit in 2020, all schools would have stopped. Like there, there was no option. They would have been, you know, going through the the AV cabinet to see if they had any old, you know, VHS tapes of something <laughs> that they can make copies and and send out. But there would not have been an option. Um, like I, I can't even fathom what's there. And the fact that across the board, you're talking K through 12, all the way, you know, to to higher ed, the transition was painful, but it worked. And, and that's that's what is so astounding. And so now the longer term answer is now that we're seeing students now accustomed to a post-COVID world, we're seeing that you know having things online is not just the norm, but in some cases expected. It gives us this entirely new tool that we can now, can, and sometimes I kind of think in food metaphors, it's a new ingredient that we never had before that as we're designing things, we can now start thinking, well, wait, we want this in person, but what if we offer this that they can access from anywhere? Um, to give you an idea, we have a, a data visualization weekend long boot camp for one of our programs. Well, some of our students can't make it. We have it fully, fully virtual, fully hybrid at the same time, which has allowed us to offer it to other programs at the exact same time which we could have never done before. We were limited by how many seats are in the class. So it has allowed us to, to be painting with a new color that is it, it, where it will go, we don't know yet, but it's exciting the kind of options it's opened up. We have just a few more questions and I have questions for all of you. So we'll go through each of you. Uh, we've talked about your roles professionally, what you do, how the internet and access to broadband has helped facilitate those. But tell me a bit about some of the things in your personal life that broadband has been able to facilitate that's been unexpected for you, um, has changed the way maybe you can take a break before work. I know I certainly love no longer being limited to the same gym hours that everyone else is limited to and makes for a happier life. Um, so tell me a little about that, Eric. I'd love to start with you. Yeah, I think one of the most personal experiences I had was realizing specifically throughout COVID is the ability that we had to keep in touch with people. I had a household full, so I had a spouse and two children with me. So there was there was no quiet moments. We were all very uh, interactive with each other during that period. Um, but I had a grandfather who was not right living by himself states away and all 13 of us grandchildren were able to get on a Zoom and and talk to him. I mean, that is that's life changing to somebody in a situation that is, you know, feeling isolated. Um, so it's one that I definitely don't take for granted, um, and really just like to like to share that that was you know it's something impactful. Um, and I've also seen it in my kids' lives. You know, kids have access now to internet beyond what they need. Um, but there's really cool opportunities. Like I have an 11 year old who watches a chef and we ordered a cocoa pod to make homemade cocoa nibs. When I was 11, I didn't even know what those words meant. Right. And, and no, no way of my life would that have been something that I experienced as an 11 year old. And yet like his, his opportunity to just research anything and expand into different cultures and try new things. It's just phenomenal. Um, so I think, you know, those personal experiences we also see happen, whether we're training students or working with remote employees, it's, it's also those personal stories, right? Their personal stories are what bring them to us, whether we're training or employing, right? There's some need, there's some need to make money or 
uh, be trained in order to have better employment. And, and when that happens in the remote and the digital space, um, it brings together that personal and that professional. And I, you know, really at the end of the day, don't think that you can fully separate that. Plinio, how about you? Yeah, I, I'll share a funny story. Um, back in 2017, maybe we were in five or six cities and it was December and I made the commitment to visit each one of our cities. And I was on my last leg of travel and I was experiencing major airline fatigue and i wanted to find this restaurant that i always ate at and i couldn't find it and the reason i couldn't find it was because i thought i was in cincinnati i was actually in columbus <laughs> so for me you know the, what there was a huge learning here i mean the efficiency that we've gained now in 19 cities being able to connect with our managing director with our staff members in each one of our cities um, without having that six, eight, 10 hour of travel time involved has been tremendous. Um, the connection is much more frequent. We're able to provide um, input on ideas and vice versa. I think it's just transformed the way we view travel. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't travel on occasion. I think that's still very important, but we don't have to do it at the volume that we thought we needed to prior to the pandemic. Oh, that's a great example. Jeremy, how about you? I'm confused by the Columbus and Cincinnati problem. Skyline Chili exists in both of those cities. I, <laughs> I, I think you would have been set. Anyway, for me, so I was actually thinking about this question since since, uh, since we had the kind of pre-meeting. And I realized that it's actually been more profound than, than I might have realized um, at first, that kind of my mental health journey, which has been heavily focused on anxiety, um, there was one thing that I had noticed pretty early on in therapy that there was there was my work me and there was my home me and never the two shall interact that as I go to work Lily on the drive in it's like I have the you know I'm putting on my armor you know even though it's not a war zone here but there's a, something else that happens and then on the drive home I'm able to take it off um, which is not a way to integrate these two parts of your lives. So what Erica said, I, I could not agree more strongly that you can't have this and this, you have to have your whole self as part of your work. And so one of the things that COVID forced on me was to finally force me to integrate my home and my work because they're now the same thing. And what I found almost immediately is how crucially important that's been for me to the point that, you know, about a month or two into it, I actually told my uh, my boss that um, in the role that I'm in, I'm more than willing to keep going, but I want to have at least two days from home, regardless of, you know, what happens post COVID. Um, the, the quiet power of walking away from my computer, going to my couch, sitting down and having my pit bull Put his head on my lap for five minutes and saying right this is life this is why i do this you know seeing my wife you know wander by um and then okay now i'm back to work it has caused an in integration between you know my whole self and and my job it's transformed the fulfillment i get from it it's transformed um just how i view it in a way that couldn't have i don't know how long it would have taken for that to happen without it um, I think I would have always, in some ways, kept those two separate, which which was not which was not a good place to be in. And one more question for both all of you: If we met back here on on another Zoom, let's say in two to three years, uh, what do you hope has changed for the areas that your organizations represent, and what do you think will be closer to? Will it be that? more hybrid model will we see again some back and forth between we want to be all remote or we want to be all in person what are you hoping to see uh erica can i start with you yeah we didn't practice this question this one this one's off the cuff now here's here's my anxiety coming in as an introvert oh you've got um, it. <laughs> if i could if i could wave a magic wand to two three years in the future um it would be one that really intentional time has been taken across all industries and companies to figure out what jobs can be remote. There will always be jobs that can't, there will always be industries that can't fully advocate and support that, but there are a lot and a lot that could make a huge difference to continued untapped talent communities out there to have access to that type of remote work. 
Um, and it's going to take everybody coming together and thinking about that very intentionally. I know there's still a lot of struggle between, do we stay remote? Do we go hybrid? Um, you know, and I think sometimes you have to strip away even like the reasons for that. Like what does the workforce really need? And the companies who aren't paying attention to that will be interesting to have them on in two to three years and see where they're at, right? If they haven't intentionally thought about where remote work needs to go within their organizations. Um, I think that coupled with companies paying attention to that belonging aspect, right? That is a challenge of remote work and in order for it to work, culture, communication, belonging, employee engagement, that has to be top of mind. Um, my LinkedIn algorithm is all about remote work. So I get to see the best of the best on a daily basis. Um, I see a lot of people scoff at titles like head of remote. Again, those are the companies who will continue to succeed. It, it, if you're going to go remote and if you want to have continued access to the best talent, no matter where they are, those are going to have to become corporate strategies that are really, really paid attention to. Um, so yeah, hopefully three years in the future, we, we see both of those things uh, top notch across the board. Plinio, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, in the Prescolis universe, I see a world where we're truly changing the face of technology and using virtual training or variations thereof to really scale our, our impact, not just in the cities that we're in, but in many more cities across the country. You know, I think about um, students like Jasmine Martin, who um, was part of our Java course in Dallas, who graduated just recently. She was previously a struggling artist. She wasn't making enough money. She needed to change her career. She didn't know where to go. And it was serendipitously as she found this program that was free that allowed her to get the training she needed to move into a good paying career. You know, within days of graduation, she landed a job as a programmer. And within a month of graduation, she moved into her own apartment. Her career is on target to be amazing. There are millions of Americans who are looking for that one opportunity. And I think this virtual world, this remote world, this in-person class, a combination of all of this really allows um, people in communities that may not have thought technology was a possibility, it can now. And I think I, I wanna be part of that movement and I think that our organization can be can be a driver in making and creating change in that area. That's great. And Jeremy. I hope that Erica is not here because she is IPO'd and is now too fancy to show up. <laughs> I hope Plinio has received so much government funding that he doesn't know what to do and the organization has grown by a factor of 100. And for us, I hope that we just keep, uh, as this becomes more the norm, students and us can co-create together and really figure out what they want to see what what we need to deliver and then that we all start thinking um you know one of the one of the themes that, that i've heard throughout that is very true is what this technology what it can do to start really going after systemic inequalities and how we can now access folks that have never been able to have this access um, in a way to intentionally kind of rethink what's possible so my biggest takeaways from our discussion and hearing from the three of you are, one, it has to be intentional. I think the intentionality that all of you have touched on in how we design remote work opportunities, how we approach skilling in order to get the maximum amount of people involved in that and address some of the inequities that exist in certain industries and make learning more accessible to more people and it not just be the undergrad to grad pipeline that you can come back years later if you want to change you want new skills that for a whole new industry we haven't even thought of yet if you could give one takeaway to our audience from today's discussion what would it be jeremy i'll start with you don't think of don't think of remote as a binary solution um you need to think of it as a tool and within that there are many ways you can use the tool but what you don't want to do is take your existing paradigm kind of how you're doing things and just ask how can we crowbar this tool into it you actually need to be designing recognizing that when you have a new tool there are things that were never ever possible 
And so getting out of the world of thinking we're either in person or virtual and thinking about, no, 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 this is a continuum that we get to decide how we put the things together, that more than anything, which exactly aligns with what you said about the intentionality of it. Plinio. Yeah, I would say that um, what all three organizations represented here is this, this ability to be courageous, right? To think outside the box, to do things that others might have thought um, was kind of um, uh, silly to do, frankly. Um, I think we need more of that. I think we need individuals that are willing to stretch the way they think. I think we've all realized that over the last three uh, years. There are things that we're doing now that we never thought we would, but we were able to take that step forward and, and take that chance. I think we need more of that thinking, um, especially as we deal with, um, you know, the new challenges that will present themselves, you know, record breaking inflation, possible recession. We truly need to think outside the box to create a much more equitable um, position for all Americans. And Erica. Yeah, one of our core values at Instant Teams is intentional curiosity. And so I think that would be my, my challenge is to think about things um, in a curious way. And when you think about questions or problems or solutions with kind of intentional curiosity at the helm, it kind of can break down whether you, you personalize an experience, right? I've talked to people like, well, remote work doesn't work for me, so it'll not, not work for anybody else. Like that's a very selfish, you know, mindset. Just because something doesn't work for you doesn't mean it can't work for you. And it doesn't mean it also can't work for millions of millions of other people. Um, and intentional curiosity, I think, then also allows people to think about just talent and skill in very different ways and very non-traditional ways. Um, and that's where the opportunity and the growth and the equity and the diversity opportunities um, continue to grow. So, yep, my challenge would be uh, to think about everything that we've talked about today with intentional curiosity. Wonderful. Well, thank you to the three of you for appearing here today. We really enjoyed having you virtually sort of underscoring the model that you can be anywhere and speak to a whole new audience about your organizations and some of these issues. Thank you again. And for those of you in the room, we're going to have an afternoon break and we'll come back together around 325 p.m. for our final panel. Thank you to all three of you. Round of applause. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.